Recent survey revealing the two most popular TV shows, GIF-wise, Ted Lasso and The Office. So what does the future of GIFs look like? Well, Samsung revealed new AI technology at an event last week called GIF Remaster, which will improve the quality of animated GIF files, even if they weren't created by the phone owner. Andrew, Jacqueline. I'm not crazy about GIFs because they repeat the same oh, joke. Oh, but that's over the best part. Over, over. <laughs> It's Thursday, February 9th, and the GOP heckling isn't limited to Democrats. We start here. With President Biden charting his course back to the White House, it's time for a Republican reckoning. Donald Trump is Hillary Clinton now. He actually has a record he's tied down to. We'll ask a strategist how the State of the Union shed a light on the party's prospects. Everybody likes a balloon unless it belongs to Chinese spies. Every second that that balloon was over the United States, we were collecting intelligence on it. Now the U.S. is warning other countries that this party included all of them. And getting to the NFL doesn't seem like such a long shot here. You're one of the best wide receivers in the country. Is that a lot of pressure? Because you're only a freshman. Nah. But amid all the dollar signs, what are the costs of living in Football City, USA? From ABC News, this is Start Here. I'm Brad Milkey. The day after the State of the Union address, it's not uncommon for a president to hit the road, sell the message, even if his speech wasn't terribly exciting. But when President Biden boarded Air Force One yesterday, the atmosphere among his staffers was jubilant. Last night I reported on the State of the Union. It is strong. The overwhelming consensus strong. from Democrats was that Tuesday night was a win. Not only had he highlighted a bold economic agenda reminiscent of old school Democrats, but he got Republicans to stand and applaud for the future of Medicare and Social Security. So Biden's people were stoked. He called out members out on live television uh, in front of millions of Americans and effectively put them on the defense. That's what we did. That's what the president did. It's on the other hand, though, this is not a president with high approval ratings across the nation. And so in some ways, yesterday was day one for Republicans as they head into a new call it a presidential election cycle. Let's start today with Sarah Isger. She's a GOP strategist and ABC News contributor. Sarah, how has this week played out from sort of a Republican viewpoint? Because even with the rowdiness alone on Tuesday night, we'd heard that Kevin McCarthy had told people, like, please sit down and just listen to the speech. Don't be shouting. And yet... Look what happened. You can't go through 16 ballots as speaker and then wonder if Kevin McCarthy is the strongest speaker that we've ever had that can really <laughs> wrangle his party. Iron and fist with Kevin just a, McCarthy. Yeah, with a, a look out of his eye, get them to behave. I mean, um, <laughs> you know, in sort of a divorced parents between Kevin McCarthy and Donald Trump, uh, he's like the weekend dad who's like, okay, fine, just ha watch the TV. Yeah, we can eat junk food. Just will you will you go to bed at midnight? Fine, sure. Um, so, you know, I think Kevin McCarthy was happy that nobody threw a tomato. That was a win. Some Republicans want Medicare and Social Security to sunset. I'm not saying it's a majority. <laughs> I do think substantively that Social Security, Medicare conversation is very interesting. Because when you think about the old school Republican Party, the three legs of the stool, Reagan Republican, and you know, limited government, budget and deficit hawks, you can't really be a budget or deficit hawk if you're mm. not talking about the two largest expenditures of the federal government, which are Social Security and Medicare. And so when Republicans on Tuesday night I mean, physically took that off the table by standing up. Social Security and Medicare are a lifeline for millions of seniors. Americans have to pay into them from the very first paycheck they started. So tonight, let's all agree, and apparently we are, let's stand up for seniors. It's a fascinating moment in the history of the Republican Party. I would say that leg of the stool, maybe it didn't like fall all the way off, but it certainly got shortened. The Republican Party's having a much larger, broader, conversation over what it's going to be. And that's where I think you get into sort of the fascinating aspect of what Republicans spent doing in the 48 hours after the State of the Union, arguing amongst themselves. I mean, you have Donald Trump putting out 
an allegation against Ron DeSantis. Yeah, let's talk about this, because if this is all about sort of the moment that Republicans are trying to define what their message is over these next couple of years, both in Congress and, you know, in the 2024 presidential cycle, you had President Trump on his social media platform basically accusing Florida Governor Ron DeSantis of, of grooming young girls, of like the, this sort of catch-all phrase that goes back to, like, pedophilia, but this idea that he was, like, trying to abuse high schoolers. DeSantis said, like, I don't smear other Republicans. Like, he was kind of like, I'm not taking the bait. Like, if this is a sort of turning point moment where it's not Kevin McCarthy necessarily leading the entire party, somebody else is itching to fill that void. Like, where has this sort of moment left Republicans? Yeah, so that's where the 2024 GOP presidential primary looks so wildly different Mm. than any in recent memory. I think the closest for me is probably the 2008 Democratic primary um, because it really became a referendum on Hillary Clinton. Uh, Hillary Clinton was the juggernaut. She was the presumed nominee that everyone kind of uh, was having trouble getting excited about. Barack Obama was the new hotness. Mm. You think back to 2016, Donald Trump was the new hotness. He had no record. He could say whatever he wanted. There was nothing to pin him down on. And everything he said, you didn't know what was coming next. It was all newsworthy. It was all fascinating. Fast forward to 2024. They said he's not doing rallies. He's not campaigning. Maybe he's lost that step. Uh, we didn't, I'm more angry now and I'm more committed now than I ever was. Cause... Donald Trump is Hillary Clinton now. He actually has a record he's tied down to. You know, the shtick isn't as interesting anymore. Whatever he says next, we're not hanging on that because he has to so keep raising the bar of absurdity in order to get more attention um, that it's sort of, you know, literally referring to the original reference of jumped the shark. Like, he's now jumping sharks to get our attention, and we're like, eh. So you have him launch this attack, attack, sir, against Ron DeSantis, and Ron DeSantis knows this isn't 2016, so he doesn't need to answer tit for tat for Trump. He doesn't need to attack him back, and instead, he's doing sort of a much more Barack Obama, I'm the new hotness. I, in, in a referendum, all I have to do is be not Donald Trump. I don't spend my time trying to smear other Republicans. That's right. The Biden economic plan is working. It's working. Joe Biden's traveling the country taking his victory lap on State of the Union where a majority of Democrats, at least before the State of the Union, didn't want him as the nominee. Sort of a mess over on the Democratic side. Don't worry. The Republican side, also big, big, interesting mess. Well, and later today, we're going to see, you know, this Republican-led House begin one of these investigations that's been long promised, this investigation into Hunter Biden. That'll be public. We've seen uh, them lambasting Twitter executives on other things like the agenda in Congress very much coming into focus. And we'll see how that kind of affects perception of both parties going forward now. Uh, Sarah Isker, thanks so much. You bet. Going back to the State of the Union for a second, you know one word President Biden never said? Balloon, which was kind of a notable omission since right as he was getting ready to give his big speech on Tuesday, U.S. officials were telling us that not only had we confirmed China's spy balloon was launched by the Chinese military, but that the unit behind it was its infamous Reconnaissance Bureau. And yesterday, the U.S. military admitted this balloon program has actually been at work for several years in dozens of countries. Let's go to John Cohen, formerly of the Department of Homeland Security. He's worked at the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. He's now an ABC News contributor. And John, before we even get into what we've learned about about the Chinese here, I've heard several analysts and Republican lawmakers surrounding the State of the Union saying, what was Biden doing? This should have been shot down over Montana or preferably even before, like the moment it entered Alaskan airspace. I mean, did we fail here? No, Brad, this wasn't a military failure. This was actually an intelligence success story. You know, when you have situations like this, there's a certain process you follow. First, you detect the anomaly, you detect the incursion, you detect, you know, whether it's a high altitude airplane or a balloon. The next thing you do is you assess the risk posed by that item. Is it a risk to people on the ground? Is it a risk to commercial aviation? Uh, Does it pose a risk from an intelligence perspective? The third step is you mitigate those risks. You prevent the intelligence collection tool from being able to collect meaningful intelligence. And from everything we've heard, we were able to do that. We took maximum precaution to uh, prevent any intel collection. We provided... Uh, counterintelligence messages out of our intelligence shop. It was trying to take pictures of sensitive locations. We were able to make sure that it did not succeed in doing what um, it wanted to do. 
Then finally, you exploit it. Every second that that balloon was over the United States, we were collecting intelligence on it. Mm. We learned how it communicated. We learned how it navigated. We learned how it was powered. We learned why it wasn't necessarily being picked up on radar. And so uh, there was a potential opportunity for us to uh, collect intel where we had gaps on prior balloons. And uh, I think you'll see in the future that uh, that uh, time frame was uh, well worth its uh, value to collect. And that is information that not only is immensely valuable to the U.S., but is also valuable to our foreign partners and our allies. And yet, John, I mean, for all that intelligence, we've learned that the Chinese have ended this program. We've apparently got U.S. officials telling us, like, yeah, I mean, they're done with this. So who is the group that launched this? And I guess how, how valuable could this balloon intelligence have been? I can't really get into specifics on the group, but what I can tell you is China, like other countries, explore a broad range of techniques as they seek to collect intelligence on other countries. And the use of this balloon was a relatively low-cost way for China to collect visual and maybe some electronic intelligence, in this case from the U.S. But, you know, on a daily basis, we are dealing with much more significant and severe intelligence collection threats by China. You know, we have to deal with Chinese satellites that are over the U.S. collecting signals intelligence, electronic intelligence, and imaging on a daily basis. China collects intelligence from government and non-government entities by building and exploiting backdoors that they put into computer and communication systems sold by Chinese technology companies and through social media apps like TikTok. Uh, China regularly... But wait, the Pentagon is saying that these went over 40 countries. Like, if China is just sending these things all around the world over so many sovereign nations, they, what, they're not getting anything from it? it? Must It must be in pursuit of something. Well, they get several things from it. One, like I said, it's a low-cost way for them to spend a little bit of money and gain some photographic uh, intelligence that maybe is of higher resolution than what they're getting from their spy satellites. Mm. But on the other hand, they gain a... Uh, a information operation value as well. Because think of the chaos that has occurred across the United States as this balloon elicited a breathless response. Mm. The uh, federal government obviously doesn't know what's in that balloon. Is that bioweapons in that balloon? Is it, did that balloon take off from Wuhan? It completed its mission. President Biden let it complete its mission before he shot it down. By public officials, and, and by some in the media, quite frankly. I mean, and they were demanding that it be shot down while at the same time opining that there was possibly nuclear or biological weapons on the balloon. Can you imagine? We think there's a nuclear or biological weapon on the balloon, so let's shoot it down over Wyoming so it can expose everybody in Wyoming. I mean, that's just ridiculous. So the military in this case... But wait, hold on for a second. You're saying that, that the Chinese might be saying, hey, maybe... Even if the Americans find this, that in itself will put them all at each other's throats. Like that's an actual thought that the Chinese military might be having. China is very sophisticated. They're very calculating. Um, I can't tell you for sure it was a part of their plan here, but they certainly are benefiting from it. Wow. Uh, and uh, I am very confident that they will integrate it into their information operations in the future. All right. In the meantime, one of the most interesting things I've learned about this so far is that apparently the U.S. military was on this balloon with those high altitude U-2 planes. And one of the reasons we discovered this thing in the first place is because we've upped some of our surveillance because of our UFO spotting policies. Like that, that it's actually played into a, perhaps why we saw this balloon a little bit earlier than some of these others that passed by us. Uh, John Cohen, just can't make this up. Thank you so much. Thanks, Brad. Nice to be with you. The Super Bowl is this weekend when, for one Sunday, this entire country seems to revolve around the NFL. But there are towns where that's basically true all year round. The Friday Night Lights are bright in Football City, USA. In fact, Rock Hill, South Carolina, calls itself Football City, USA, a place that sends more football players to the NFL than any other place its size. I can't live without football. If I couldn't play football, I'd be desperate. Yeah! What happens when football is that ingrained in your town's identity, when so many people's fates rely, in one way or another, on NFL Sunday? People here have a motto, NFL or bust. It's kind of true. NFL or bust is like, for me, it was NFL or streets. 
Let's go to ABC's Marjorie McAfee. She's been making trips to Football City, USA recently. She traveled there with Michael Strahan and the gang at Nightline Impact. Because, Marjorie, you've been thinking about this for a while. When we say this place is football-centric, what does that look like? Well, what it means is you've got a town that's about 75,000 people. When you look at it, it's per capita sent the most guys to the NFL. So there's kind of these three main high schools that are these powerhouses. They've each sent seven or eight guys. Um, and I'm talking about guys who were actually physically playing on the field. Um, for the NFL, it's, it's a pretty impressive number. <laughs> You get this kind of, you know, this this wonderful dream that gives these little boys something to look forward to. Touchdown, Touchdown. You start to look at it and say, well, all these guys are doing it. This guy that I know who I maybe played in the Pee Wee League with, well, he made it. So if he can do it, maybe I can too. And so it starts to become this, this dream that maybe a lot of boys in America have of making to the NFL. If I couldn't play football, I wouldn't even know like myself because I've been doing it my whole life. That's my main personality. That's what everybody know me from, football. When you live in Rock Hill, it starts to feel like something that's really actually attainable. I want to be in the NFL. That's plan A. Uh, plan B is not mess up plan A. Nah, I'm playing. <laughs> nah, plan B is to finish college. We can look at it through um, this young man that we met, uh, Jazavian Currents. He's 14 years old. He's in ninth grade. And Fat Jay is starting as a ninth grader and had pretty good coverage on that play. Yeah, you don't see many ninth graders starting. He's starting varsity as a freshman, which is pretty unheard of. He's excellent. He is a phenomenal player. You're one of the best wide receivers in the country. Is that a lot of pressure? Because you're only a freshman. Nah, you can't let the game get bigger than yourself. I don't think about it too much. His dad played. His dad played with guys who went on to the NFL. His dad grew up um, going to football games as a young boy with his father. I told him since he was 10 years old, okay, well, I'm impressed. Now we're going to prepare now while you're 10. We love the game. It brings us closer as every, in every aspect of life. For Jazavian, it's, it's a family bond. And already he has multiple offers uh, to play college football, which is truly insane. From colleges had, as a freshman in high school. That's exactly right. And he had several of those offers before he even started day one of his ninth grade year. I mean, he was technically a middle schooler wow. uh, the summer between eighth grade and ninth grade getting scouted. And so I've actually lost track of how many offers he has already because it is it is more than six. It is, it is numerous. And he's halfway through his freshman year. Well, so... Like, that sounds great. <laughs> like, that sounds like, so what a prestigious place to be from. What a great spot to be in. And yet, what I found fascinating about your reporting was that you kind of examined the underbelly of this, right? What, what are the drawbacks when this is so much a part of your town's culture? I mean, what happens for people who don't make it? There's got to be a lot. So what we know is um, from the NCAA is that nationally, uh, about 7% of um, high school players go on to play college ball. And then from there, we know that only about 1.5% of college football players go on to play in the NFL. So nationally, your odds are pretty low. They might be maybe a smidgen higher in Rock Hill because the numbers there are so good, um, but it's not going to be significantly higher. What would you tell parents who want to get their son involved in football? I would tell them to make sure that they don't put all your eggs in one basket, number one. For a lot of these boys and young men, they will make it as far as they possibly can, and it may sometimes fall short. And then there's that feeling of, I don't know how to define myself. I don't know who I am. Mm. I feel lost. Um, and we really saw that come through with Jabril Fuel. I had 17 offers coming into my senior year from all over, but it was like, it's almost a guarantee. I just got to do the schoolwork. He is another hometown son. He was an excellent standout player in high school. Um, and everyone said, obviously, you're going to the NFL. And, you know, he tried and he didn't make it. And he came home to Rock Hill and he just said, I, I, I feel lost. Oh, shoot. It was hard. I mean, it was, it was depressing. I felt shame. You know what I mean? I felt like a failure. Uh, and I didn't know what was really next, so I kind of went into a dark area. He said it became hard to even go to places like the grocery store in town because these people would came up, you know, come up to him and say, I thought you were going to make it, or what happened, or you blew your chance. So you play pro ball? Nah. Well, should have been. Rookie mini camp, training camp, oh, stuff yeah. like that. Never, not never materialized after that. And what he told me is, I'm not the only one. There's a town full of guys who go through this um, in Rock Hill. It's, it's, it's really tough. It's a dream that seems 
like reality mm -hmm. because it's happening so much. But in reality, it, it's it's not. It's like a, a fool's goal a little bit. What happens is you might actually make it to the NFL, but it may not be the career that you think it's going to be. You could get injured. You could get cut. You could get traded a bunch of different times and end up on six different teams in six years, which is what happened to Philip Adams. Eventually intercepted by Philip Adams. He was another Rock Hill native son, excellent standout player. And we'll go out and see him play on Friday nights. And, you know, he used to put on a show, you know what I mean? And he used to call him Fresh. Played for South Carolina State, and, you know, he got drafted to the NFL. And so, generally, you know, a pretty successful story because he's actively playing. Phillip was, like, three years older than me, so, like, he played. I wasn't super, super close with him, but he was, like, like my little, like my little idol. You looked up to him? I looked up to him. But what happens is, you know, he faces so many injuries um, when he's in the NFL, including uh, two concussions across three games, which is pretty tough. And so what we know is after he left the NFL, he came home to Rock Hill. And first of all, he's struggling with the identity issue um, mentally and physically and hits a low point. 911, what's going on on Marshall Road? I think there's been a bad shooting. There's nothing about this right now that makes sense to any of us. A motive that we, is still unknown, he killed six people and then himself in the spring of 2021. Authorities launching a desperate manhunt. The description we're given was a black male wearing black clothing, carrying something red, possible automatic gun. That search would lead them to a former NFL player, Philip Adams. To say it was shocking is that's an understatement. This community absolutely could not believe that this had happened. The folks that he shot were beloved pillars in the community. It was a doctor and his wife and their two of their young grandchildren, um, two HVAC workers who were working at that home. That dude was one of the nicest people I ever met in my life. I just want people to know he was. Wasn't that way. And Philip himself, by everybody I've talked with, said this is not who Philip was. Adam's father, Alonzo, telling a local station, WCNC, his son never bothered anybody. Well, I can say that he's a good kid. He was a good kid, and he, uh, I think the football messed him up. And I know the doctor who examined his brain said, yeah, CTE appeared quite severe in his case. Frontal lobe damage can contribute to anger, rage, paranoia, several disorders. But the doctor also said it's rarely a clear line, that it's multifactorial. In any event, though, Marjorie, are there solutions here? Because, like, you don't want to tell a town to stop being successful at what's gone so well, and yet it does seem like there are downsides here. Like, what, what do you do about them? I think that um, it is not realistic to think that football is going away in Rock Hill or in America. I think people have become increasingly aware, especially this season, right. of um, some pretty high-profile injuries in football. Growing backlash around the NFL after Miami Dolphins quarterback Tua Tagovailoa takes a violent hit. It's a neurological response to head trauma. Anything can happen. Do you ever worry about that? It, yeah, it's it's always that slight fear that, you know, you never know what can happen. But at the same time, we know when you sign up that, you know, injuries are a part of it. But it is a sport that America loves and certainly that Rock Hill loves. What Jabril Fuel will tell you is, look, Let's work with football. Let's use it to make your life as good as you can possibly make it without this expectation that you're going to go pro. All right, let me get three claps for the best, Jabril. He has these uh, youth football camps now. And so he is teaching the kids the athleticism of football and how to play. But he says it's equally important for them to be aware of the fact that you've got to have your mental health in place ask for help if you're struggling. Once people realize that football is 90% mental, 10% physical, they'll understand how important a mental health piece is to the football piece. Uh, it, really fascinating reporting here. Uh, Marjorie McAfee from Nightline Impact, by the way, that airing every week on Hulu. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you so much, Brad. And one last thing. This is a big year for trademark infringement law, and at least one of these cases could affect my dog. A few years ago, we got our Poodle Bichon mix named Frank, what we thought was a pretty baller toy. It's a little bottle of whiskey that squeaks. It even has what looks like a Jack Daniels label. When you look closer, it says Bark Daniels. You're a booze hound. 
There are imitations that say bad spaniels, which I actually think is more clever. Well, Jack Daniels has now sued the bad spaniels maker for trademark infringement, and that suit will finally be argued at the Supreme Court next month. <gasps> oh. But yesterday, there was an even more bizarre trademark case. A New York jury had to decide whether a company could sue if its product was copied in the metaverse. So, quick little reminder of what the metaverse is. It's like your online self in the digital world, right? In the not-so-distant future, Mark Zuckerberg thinks you're going to show up to virtual meetings, not just on a Zoom screen, but as a virtual character with virtual outfits. Online, you could be a cooler version of yourself. Heck, you could be an aardvark. Limitless possibilities. Well, a digital designer started making digital handbags in the form of NFTs. He calls them Meta Birkins. Surprise, last but not least, my first... Birkin in my most used bag. If you like fashion, of course, you know what a Birkin bag is. It's a boxy, luxurious handbag from the Parisian fashion house Hermes. And a single Birkin costs as much as a car. These meta Birkins cost $450 because, oh yeah, they're not real bags. They're like a digital riff on a Birkin. They come in different colors. Some are fuzzy, even provocative. One has an image of a fetus on it. Hermes didn't like that. Thought it messed with their brand. They sued. And yesterday, in a landmark victory, they they won. The jury sided with Hermes, which to NFT makers is a devastating blow. In the short history of the metaverse, these designers have seen themselves as artists. Like Campbell's is not suing Andy Warhol for painting soup cans. It's art. What's the problem with poking some fun at a luxury brand? The difference here, perhaps, is that the metaverse purports to be an extension of the real world. Well, by that logic, stuff that exists in the metaverse should have to follow the same rules. The jury ruled that even though this is a bunch of pixels, meta Birkins are more of a commodity, not a form of expression, not art. And even though Hermes is on record saying they couldn't point to real losses suffered as a result, the jurors thought an ordinary person could easily associate a meta Birkin with a real one. As for Bark Daniels, well, Frank says if anyone's wasting time with digital toys or even real glass bottles, I don't know what they're missing. And by the way, you can see my dog Frank on Instagram this morning trying to enjoy his last drops of freedom with his toy before the Supreme Court rules on the chew toy industry. You can check us out at Start Here ABC on Instagram. By the way, I assume we've got like pet owners that enjoy listening with their pets to Start Here. In fact, Laura Johnson, one of our listeners, has written to say our dog comes in every morning when he hears Brad's voice. Well, I don't know what that says about my voice, but if there are more of you, Hit us up. Let us know on Instagram. Again, start here, ABC. I'm Brad Milkey. See you tomorrow. We're honored. ABC's 2020 winner of three Emmy Awards.